Hey everyone, I'm Michael from Bardic Inspiration and I want to welcome you to the first episode of a series that we're going to be calling When Last We Left Off, which is basically going to be something of a campaign diary where I get to talk about an adventure that I ran. In this series, I'll be talking about the plot of the adventure, the players involved and the characters that they played as, some behind the screen moments, anything else that contributes to the telling of the full story of this campaign, as well as maybe a lesson or two that you might be able to take away from my experiences and use in your own games. But first, let's get into some setup. My home group that I play for is about to be starting The Rise of Tiamat, which is this one right here, which is a sequel to the module Horde of the Dragon Queen, which actually is this one right here. And Horde of the Dragon Queen was the first module that was released for Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition. We had previously played through Horde of the Dragon Queen, having wrapped that campaign up uh, last summer or so, and decided to take a break for a minute on starting Rise of Tiamat because it is more sandboxy. As such, I've decided to start rereading through Horde of the Dragon Queen, mostly just to refresh my own memory in order to prep for the adventure. But it got me reminiscing a lot about some of the fun and like wacky times that we had playing this module. That's more or less where the inspiration for this series was born. So, hey, I guess thanks, Tiamat. So join me now as I take you through my group's experience playing Horde of the Dragon Queen. To start off, I'll give you a little bit of background on like the module itself, as well as my group's history trying to play this module, and you'll see what I mean in a second. Horde of the Dragon Queen, like I had mentioned earlier, was the first adventure written in August of 2014 for the, at the time, newly released Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition. It was designed by Wolfgang Bauer and Steve Winter with additional adventure contributions from Mike Merles, Christopher Perkins, Matthew Cernet, Chris Sims, and Rodney Thompson. A brief spoiler-free synopsis of this adventure for anyone unfamiliar with the module could be summed up more or less as this. The players encounter a cult that's pillaging their way across the Sword Coast and are tasked with tracking down the cult to discover not only their whereabouts, but also their motives. And to stop them. You know, it wouldn't be much of a heroic adventure without that part. So... This was not my group's first time trying to play through this adventure. It, in fact, actually, it was our third. The two previous attempts failed because, one, I was a pretty inexperienced DM back in 2014, and I had a hard time sorting through the way the information was laid out in the book in a way that made the game experience enjoyable because it would just stop sessions for me to hunt down pieces of information. So we stopped that playthrough of the campaign in order for me to try my hand at something a little bit more simpler so that way I could get a better feel for DMing as a whole. And the second attempt failed because Matt's college schedule got a little bit too busy for us to play consistently, which originally was just supposed to be a hiatus, but it ended up taking so long, really, that by the time we were ready to start playing it again, everyone forgot what had happened. So it was just a better idea to start the game over. That said, the first attempt at trying to play this uh, module actually is what birthed our group's legend of Skullgar, the Kobold Slayer, which is something that we might talk about at another point in time. So maybe in the comments, be sure to bug Matt so that way that story can get told. Also, as a nice like little full circle moment, the first successful video on this channel was us talking about how we built our custom D&D table and our first successful run at Horde of the Dragon Queen was the first campaign we played on this very table. So hey, a little fun bit of trivia for you there. Now, before we get into the meat and potatoes of the campaign here, I'd like to talk a little bit about the adventure itself. Now, without being like a full on apologist or anything, I think that Horde of the Dragon Queen gets a little bit of a bad rep that I don't think it totally deserves. Having finished it now, I think that there are some criticisms that definitely I agree with and that are definitely valid, which we'll get more in depth with as they come up in the campaign. But even in spite of those flaws, I still found this campaign to be really enjoyable. And I, as far as I'm aware, my players do too. Now, one of the reasons that this adventure gets some uh, gets some criticism that I think I that I 100% agree with is that I wish that the information was organized a little bit more comprehensively because that is almost surely why it was so difficult for me to run the first time. The information is all over the place and there are a few slow spots in the pacing as well. But the feedback from my group has been pretty positive overall in regards to the experience that this module provides. So. I feel like that's really what's important at the end of the day. That said, there was a re-release of the Horde of the Dragon Queen and Rise of Tiamat in 2019, all in one book instead of two separate ones, just titled Tyranny of Dragons, which was the original name of the 
two adventures together, from which I've heard actually has a few tweaks to reflect how 5th edition has changed and evolved over the years, as well as it reworks the opening chapter. So I'd be interested to see how that compares to the original book that I ran the adventure out of. If any of the issues that I had with it were specifically addressed, I bet that a lot of people who had negative opinions of this module would probably look at the adventure more favorably. So we'll see. A few gripes are with some of the narrative choices that the module takes, which that's a whole different story. I'll get into those when they come up. Now that we have all of that out of the way, we can finally get into my players and the characters that they played. So the original party consisted of five players. Uh, Matt, his old roommate, Steven, our longtime group members and friends, Nate and Tyler, and another friend of ours named Andrew. Personally, five players, I think, is the perfect group size. But you've seen our table build video, I'm sure. So, so you know that it's built for six. Six is still manageable. Five, six, preferable. Anyway, Matt is playing our wood elf arcane archer named Teriel. Nate, a moon elf blade singer named Faniel. Andrew plays Damien, a wood elf rogue. Tyler plays a human artificer named Caspian. And lastly, Steven was a tiefling wildfire druid named Fenris. Now, you may have noticed that with Steven's character, I did use the past tense was. That's what we in the business call foreshadowing. So one of the biggest obstacles I often see with new campaigns is that it can be kind of difficult to get your character tied into the main conflict of the campaign in a meaningful way, at least, that doesn't like spoil the plot for the player ahead of time. It's difficult, in my opinion, in that it requires a certain amount of cooperation between the player and the DM that might not be immediately obvious to, uh, to a player that's relatively new to the game, likewise with a new DM. It's the DM's job to tell a story, but it's also the DM's job to facilitate the player's actions. While telling a story is a big part of D&D, you have to remember that it's not scripted. The player's actions should influence the plot, at least to an extent. At the very least, the players need to feel like their actions are at least contributing to the way the story unfolds. Likewise, it's the player's job to play out the actions of their character, but at the same time, you need to have a reason to participate in the adventure that the DM has prepared. If you make a character that has no interest in pursuing the plot hooks that are given to you by the DM, then congratulations, you've made an NPC. Now go and make a new character for the game that we're supposed to be playing. Also, be respectful to the other players too. It's a collaborative game. Your fun's not more important than theirs. I guess that's kind of where today's lesson could come in. There should be a give and take relationship between the players and the DM. The DM shouldn't be so rigid in their plot that the character decisions don't matter. But at the same time, the players shouldn't just be trying to derail the DM's campaign just for kicks. I understand that these are like two ends of the extremes, really. But uh, I think it illustrates pretty well that there is a very attainable middle ground here. So in short, just don't be that guy. Respect your DM, respect your players. So that whole tangent was really just a way to get into the character backstories for the Horde of the Dragon Queen campaign. In the back of the book, there's actually uh, a list of various backstory ideas that the players can use to tie their characters to the campaign, which completely solves the problem that I was just talking about. I haven't read through all of the modules that have been released so far, but I have seen a few others that do this exact same thing as well. So I'm a huge fan of that. I had all of my players roll on this list to start making their backstories, so we'll go through those now. Matt's character, and I'll start referring to everyone as their character name after this point. Teriel has been having some strange visions where the world is destroyed through various elemental means, and at the end of each dream, ten evil eyes glare back at him from the darkness. He gets some strange sixth sense type feeling that he should go to the village of Greenest to investigate further and hopefully he can find some more answers there. Nate's character, Thaniel, has heard rumors that his childhood friend, a half-elf named Talus, has gone missing, possibly kidnapped by some strange group of dragon cultists. His investigation has led him to the village of Greenest, where hopefully he can find another lead that can point him in the direction of his friend Talus. Now, I made some changes to this particular backstory, partly on the spot, and I'll get to those changes in when they come up in the adventure in a future episode. So keep that in mind if you're thinking about running this adventure sometime, because the changes that I made, I personally think are made for a much better payoff for not only Nate as a player, but also his character. Andrew's character, Damien, was driven from his family home by a raiding band of orcs, and the villagers of Greenest took him in. As such... He truly considers Greenest his home now and will do basically anything he can to protect it. 
Andrew also added in himself that his character wants to one day become a famous pirate, which is kind of unfortunate considering that Greenest is landlocked. Uh, an elf can dream, I guess. Now, Stephen's character, Fenris, was once actually a member of the Cult of the Dragon until some rivals in the cult arranged to take him out. Though his family was killed, he managed to escape the cult, believing him to be dead. So now he seeks revenge on three particular people. A human named Frulam Mondoth, a half-orc named Bogluck, and a half-dragon named Resmir. He heads to the village of Greenest, knowing that the cult will be raiding it next. And finally, Tyler's character, Caspian, a survivor of a dragon attack. His family dead and his home destroyed, he swears vengeance upon dragonkind. With nothing but the clothes on his back and a horrid scar to remind him of his near-fatal wound, he sets out on his quest. So, there's our cast of characters. A few thoroughly edgy boys and the typical hero types, but each one with a compelling reason to be on the adventure. When the inciting action kicks off, and in this case, it's actually like pretty much immediately, the characters will have zero issue getting themselves involved. As a DM, it's a really nice feeling when the players bite on your plot hooks. So the fact that this module has that baked in is a pretty nice feature in my opinion. If you wanna run this module yourself, I highly recommend using these background templates, especially having your players roll for them. I think that my players ended up with results that they never would have picked otherwise if, if they had seen the list beforehand and just picked off of it. And they were all really committed to playing out how these backstories would influence their personalities. Ironically, this would be some of the most fleshed out characters that my group has ever actually made, and I really did not expect that for a module. Now, whenever I actually get to be a player, I think of my characters with this kind of a result in mind. So if anyone out there was ever skeptical about running a pre-written adventure like I used to be, hey, who knows, just try it. So how does this adventure begin with the classic caravan approach? Maybe it's not as cliche as meeting in a tavern or anything like that, but it's got to be number two, right? Each character individually has their own reason for being in this caravan traveling to the village of Greenest, except for Damien, of course, because he lives in the village, so he's already there and therefore not in the caravan. Now, to set the scene, the village comes into view as they top a hill in the green fields, just a few short miles from the village of Greenest. All seems normal until they hear the thunderous roar of a dragon, and the sounds of combat ring throughout the plains. Now, as an aside, I like to use music and sound effects in my games, and I've gotten a lot of really good tracks uh, in my collection to use, from epic battle music to ambient setting sounds. And in this particular instance, since the dragon attacking the village is a blue dragon, I played the sound of a thunderclap and then used the iconic Godzilla roar for the dragon. It was pretty cool. Then I instantly switched to some like high energy, but still ominous sounding battle music. Upon seeing the imminent carnage in front of them, the heroes of the caravan rallied the wagons and took off at breakneck speed towards the village. And so our adventure begins. But that's where this episode's going to end. The module is broken up into eight chapters, so I'll be covering each one of them in their own dedicated video, talking about how my players handled them with a final episode that I'll use to like conclude my thoughts on the adventure and reflect on the experience as a whole. Then after that, we'll move straight into how my players are progressing through Rise of Tiamat. So thanks for watching as this bard tells the tale of the tyranny of dragons, and I'll catch you in the next episode of When Last We Left Off.